Um, first slide, let me see. One second. All right. So I'm working for Krunenthal, which is a mid-sized pharmaceutical company, about 4,500 people worldwide, specializing in pain medications. Um, most of those medicines are, are modern opioids. And um, just we do regular small molecule uh, discovery. Krunenthal is a fully integrated uh, pharmaceutical company meaning we have medicinal chemistry in-house and that means synthesis and that uh, leads me actually to talk. Um, that leads me to chemical analytics. So we have about five to ten thousand substances per year to analyze and on peak days we have about fifty to a hundred and we use our analytics machine, as I call it here, both for internal synthesis uh, analytics as well as for analytics on externally synthesized compounds. So on a typical day, if you know, get, you get a big package of compounds shipped in from a supplier, um, I have to do like almost a hundred compound uh, substance analytics a day. In a perfect world, um, the synthetic chemist um, or the a substance handling colleague would just submit the substance to that chemical analytics machine and gets immediately a report about chemical structure being correct or incorrect and secondly about um, the purity of the sample whether it meets a minimum requirement or not. If you think a bit uh, closer about, anal uh, about automating that chemical analytics uh, process you have to think about two processes. First of all, you need an automation for the substance material workflow and secondly, you need some automated process for the substance data workflow. We've done some work onto the substance material workflow as follows. In a typical scenario, we submit one milligram of substance, either the chemist or like whoever handles the substance that come in from externally into a little class vial with a barcode and you can choose between one or two solvents, you can choose between uh, one out of three NMR methods and then that little class vial is put on the inbox of this liquid handling machine. That machine is balancing the substance, is dissolving the substance, an organic solvent and then it's splitting that solution, substance solution, into two 96 well microtiter plates. One microtiter plate is used for LCMS measurements and the second is used for NMR measurements. So you only have to submit one sample, one batch, and you get both analytics, LCMS plus NMR done. Secondly, you group the, uh, the number of individual substances that come in over the day or over handling a package of compounds into a 96 well plate rather than having individual vials or yeah, individual coatings. So let's focus on the NMR workflow. Then I have these uh, uh, um, organic solvents in a 96 well plate. Then next slide here, I boil off the organic solvent because in the first dilution set we do use a fairly dilute, uh, dilute solution which is also good for M uh, LCMS. Then I have tri compound substance in the 96 volt plate. Then I use another liquid handling machine and add the deuterated solvent for NMR analysis in a fairly concentrated way. So I dissolve it here and I transfer the solution of the deuterated solvent into these 96 well rack of NMR tubes. And that rack can then be put into the uh, sampling machine for the NMR and after NMR uh, acquisition has completed, I throw away all those 96 well box of NMR tubes. So you see the major time saving for the substance handling process is just grouping individual samples in 96 well format yeah, and having like disposable tubes in this process. Good. So. Next, let's focus 
a bit uh, further on these NMR tubes. You may have seen already from the pictures before, I use uh, uh, unusually thin 1.7 millimeter diameter NMR tubes, which have a sample volume of just 30 microliters. Um, that low sample volume allows me with a substance quantity of about one milligram to have a concentrated solution and uh, which is good for acquiring even insensitive 2D spectra such as the carbon HMSPC in a small amount of time such as like eight minutes. Yeah, small sample volume helps you to record uh, even insensitive NMR experiments in a short period of time and also reduce residual like water in your in your sample and stuff like that. Good. So next let's have a look at the substance data workflow. So compounds that come in from external uh, synthesized providers have like a barcoded vial like this. So people just scan in the barcode and that gives all the information about substance names and so on. For internal synthesis, people usually print out the substance name from their electronic lab book and then that name could be scanned in and that could be a final synthesis product, it could be like an intermediate or could be an EDAP for a reaction. In addition, we allow people just also to type in the substance name if for some reason they don't have uh, access or are there next to their electronic lab book. Then we collect the substance information for the samples that come in across a day, like in a work list, yeah, and then we use Excel macros to trigger the liquid handling for the organic solvents from this work list and secondly we trigger by a, by, by a uh, second macro um, the NMR data acquisition for that work list. So it's one push of a button and you can like pipe have 50 to 100 samples in that 96 will uh, played and likewise you can set up like 50 to 100 NMR data sets from acquisition just by pushing that one button. We do record uh, a regular proton NMR spectrum plus uh, carbon uh, 13 edited 2D spectra. For the 2D spectra we use non-uniform sampling yeah, which gives you a much sharper line width uh, for the given uh, data acquisition time. We also allow users here in automation at the front to select a 2D nosy as a NMR experiment and then we would also use non-uniform sampling for the 2D nosy in this automated process flow. So the cornerstone and the workhorse of substance data uh, automation is obviously the software. We use Mestanova's uh, very, uh, Verify Listener or alternatively Batch Verify version of it and that would process and assign yeah, a whole list uh, of whatever 50 to 100 uh, substance data that's just in one run without any further uh, user interaction. It uses the raw data from the NMR machine and the chemical structures from the electronic lab book in our company. And then it uh, transfers those data into a, a, a master labs database and that would be accessible to all the users who are interested in the results. That would mean chemists, that would mean data, uh, substance data handling people or, or other people who are interested in whatever patent filing and so on. They all have floating licenses and access the data on that database. So it's now about time to have a look how these data look like. Um, for each substance I get one document here in the Mestranova uh, software that contains the chemical structure, that contains the unique sample name, that contains some further sample information such as uh, the, uh, the colleague who submitted the sample, the solvent, and some other uh, data that are carried along, that contains the set of NMR spectra recorded um, for that sample 
So in the standard set, it would be a proton NMR, it would be a 2D HSQC and a 2D HMPC spectrum, but it could also be a, like a 2D NOSI or whatever other spectra are requested. Yeah, And then this data is actually analyzed or checked from by non-expert NMR users in a very simple way. I'll give you an example. So the first and most obvious information given here is just the score from the automatic structure verification, which comes up here, and that tells you whether the chemical structure is correct, then it will be green and the score will be high, or it's incorrect, then it will be uh, highlighted red and the score will be very low. There's a twilight zone, uh, color-coded in yellow, why you need to do a more manual uh, investigation. And the second key information for the chemist is obviously the relative purity. In this case, the purity was automatically assigned as 92%. Uh, percent. So, with that information, with a high score, an average user, the chemist would say, right, that's probably all right. He wouldn't uh, do, uh, do much further analysis. Um, if you want to be a bit more careful in checking your substance sample, you can do two further steps. You can just look at the proton NMR spectrum and count the hydrogen integrals on your peaks and compare that number with the number of hydrogen atoms in your molecule. And the second would be you look at the uh, carbon-13 multiplicity additive HSQC spectrum and again you do the counting job, you count the CH, CH2 and CH3 signals in the spectrum and compare it with a number of expected atom groups of this type in your uh, chemical structure. So in both cases you just have simple counting jobs, you count between like 1 and a maximum of 20 or 25 uh, carbon atoms and you don't need any detailed NMR experience or expert knowledge about multiplicities and all these other things just to get a quick check whether those data match the chemical structure that you are expected to get. And only if you want to go deeper into the analysis like for more experts or very well trained uh, um, users you would then check the chemical shifts for like carbons between the prediction and the measured ones. You would uh, look for long-range couplings in the HMPC. So that would be an application when you are worried about uh, radioisomers, about some other whatever mix-ups in your samples. Good. So, if the core activity about checking whether the substance chemical structure is correct or incorrect just relies on these automated uh, structure verification score. Uh, one has to raise the question how reliable is the automated uh, structure verification scoring? And to have a look at that we use the small test set of 20 chemical diverse substances which by and large match uh, the chemical matter that we handle and synthesize in our medicinal chemistry activity. So just as an example, we have hydrogen rich saturated ring systems yeah, where the hydrogens overlap in 1D proton spectra, yeah, where you sometimes have overlap of the water line yeah, in this case, but you also have like hydrogen poor aromatic systems which are highly substituted um, and where it's difficult just to work with proton uh, a 1D spectra uh, of its own. And also we have obviously amides and other uh, water exchangeable hydrogens where you get usually broad lines and where you also the hydrogen integral numbers may be less reliable than or, uh, you're used to with other parts of your molecule. So, and then we just did the automated structure verification as I showed you before for these ones, for these 20 compounds. And here's the results uh, shown. Here's the verification score on the, on, on the y-axis and on the x-axis that's just the enumeration of these 20 substances. And you see for the analysis done here with the Mastronova version of 8.2, um, that is a uh, older version that was available at that time, we get um, about 80% of the substances get a score 
uh, above the threshold, meaning they're predicted that the chemical structure is correct, but we have an addition four uh, substances where the prediction says the chemical structure is or might be incorrect. So those ones would have to be double checked by the user and double checking would mean just counting the hydrogen integrals and counting the CH groups in the HSQC. So even manual cross-checking that data wouldn't take very long and could be done by a non-expert user. Good. So you could look into these data a bit um, in a bit more detail. So you could ask yourself how many of the observable signals in the 1D proton NMR and in the 2D HSQC spectra are correctly assigned by the automatic software algorithm. And here I give you the overview and a table for these 20 substances. As an example, so substance number one, you get a total of 37 signals yeah, in the 1D proton and in the HSQC spectrum, and four of them are erroneously assigned. So you would have to manually handle and double-check those four signals. There's another example here, uh, substance number nine, or uh, you get 20 signals in the spectra and all of them are correctly assigned, so you don't have to do anything for correcting that assignment set. And another less favorable example here, you have 24 signals in these two spectra and 11 are uh, misassigned and you would have to manually correct them just to get a, a good assignment and a, a thorough um, uh, assessment of that sample. In average, across that set of 20 substances, we get like 19 uh, signals in these two spectra and three of them are on average uh, erroneously assigned and need manual cross-checking. So if you put that into like a workload estimate, yeah, 80% of the signals in these two spectra are automatically and correctly handled by the software and you only have to deal with 20% of those signals which are problematic, which are difficult, which for example have exchange broadening or which have overlap with the residual water signal and you could focus your precious expert time or the precious user, manual user interaction time just on the difficult part of the molecule while the simple stuff is taken off your shoulder just by the software. Good. <clears throat> Mentioning erroneous assignments. So, the second important question is um, does the automatic structure verification recognize false chemical structures? Obviously, that is the main job of NMR analytics, um, discovering whenever a chemical structure is, is incorrect. And for that, we generated three sets of erroneous chemical structures for each of these 20 substances uh, at a different difficulty level for the automatic assignment job. So first, a set which is relatively simple, we changed uh, more than one carbon and hydrogen atom of the given chemical structure of that substance. And that would mimic um, cases where the chemical reaction didn't convert you know, the educts fully and erroneously uh, an educt or um, a partially converted part of the chemical reaction was purified by the chemist. Or secondly, it could be a mix-up of educts, it could be a mix-up of the final product, or um, I get cases where an educt reacts more than once with a scaffold in the chemical reaction. You know, if you have some other additional mildly reactive chemical groups, you may get uh, two or three educts reacting with your scaffold. And if in those cases have on top a low UV signal or poor retention time on your HPLC uh, MS column, your analytics will rely solely on the NMR uh, spectra to detect the erroneous chemical structure here. We generated a medium difficulty level set where we just changed one carbon to an oxygen atom in the chemical structure. So that could be like in five membered hats, we just change a carbon to an oxygen or we change uh, an aliphatic carbon to an ether uh, oxygen in an aliphatic chain. 
you know, a smaller change and it will be a bit more difficult to detect. And lastly, we generated a very difficult uh, test set. So we, uh, we generated uh, uh, regular isomers where we just, for example, changed the substitution on aromatic ring systems from para to meta and so on, and just to see how good the structure verification works on that. Let me start off with the easy test set where we change several uh, atoms. Um, in with the green crosses, you see the automatic score for the correct structure, and on with red crosses, with um, gray background, you see the score for the incorrect structure. And for most of these substances, you get a good separation between correct and incorrect uh, structures. There's only one case here, substance number 17, where this uh, relationship is inverted. Most of the incorrect chemical structures fall below the threshold of the uh, structure verification score, meaning they are labeled as incorrect. There are only two cases uh, which are above, and that means you have a 10% a false positive rate for these examples of structure verification. The next medium level, difficulty level uh, test set, you see similar uh, result. Correct chemical structure in green, incorrect chemical structure, a red cross, and here it becomes the separation between correct and incorrect on average gets a bit smaller, and we see a total of one, two, three, four, five substances uh, where the incorrect chemical structure falls above the uh, cutoff level and would be uh, labeled as correct. So that gives you a a false positive rate here and this cutoff of 25%. Lastly, let's look into regular isomers. To better cover the breadth of regular isomers, we uh, generated four erroneous regular isomeric structures, yeah, which are shown here uh, as scores in red, yellow, purple, and blue. And to keep the diagram uh, a little bit, uh, to make it not too messy, we just show you here the average of correct structures over the um, 20 substances in green. And here would be the average of 20 incorrect uh, regular isomer 1 structures in red. And then the second regular isomer of that substance averaged over the 20 substances in yellow and so on. And it's easy to see the uh, spacing, the difference in score between the correct and the incorrect structures becomes very small and all of them fall above the fixed cutoff level. So for discriminating between correct and incorrect uh, regular isomers, the automatic structure verification is not reliable and doesn't work. But you have to be fair. Yeah, if you tailor incorrect regular isomers and you just analyze the proton 1D spectrum plus the HSQC, even a trained NMR expert will in many cases uh, be not capable of discriminating between the two often ambiguous situations. So you would need to use analyze additional spectra such as HMBC or NOSI spectra to uh, discriminate between correct and incorrect here. There's some other combination, computational tool, it's called Concurrent Combined Verification, published by Sergei Golodwin and Patrick Vila, which put a bit more computational effort behind uh, discriminating with regular isomers, but still the score by itself wouldn't be sufficiently reliable to get a good spacing in between and decide just on the scoring which one is correct and incorrect. And that leads me to sum up um, what I've told you. So first of all, um, partial automation of NMR sample preparation works in a routine lab setting. So we have been doing that for over two years. Yeah. The main saving is just grouping individual samples, substances into 96 racks rather than handling one at a time across the day, just put them into a, a container of whatever, 9060, and that saves obviously hands-on FTE time. 
Secondly, concerning the data information workflow, automatic structure verification does generate false positives and false negatives. It is particularly unreliable for regular isomers and exchange broadened signals, so those do need manual cross-checks, but uh, the automatic structure verification does correctly process and assign um, the majority of the NMR signals, 80% for this test sample on average, and it takes significant workload off your, uh, of your NMR expert or whatever the chemist user uh, who has to look at those data. Yeah, in that way. And we have most of our samples indeed analyzed by um, non-expert users these days. Yeah, we just look at the rough estimate of chemical structure correct or incorrect that comes from the software automation and we'll have a quick look at the relative purity. And then on top we just do that hydrogen and, and CH signal counting and that's about the the quality level of analysis we have for routine substance NMR spectra. And with that, I think we save significant time over like an expert analysis and we also speed up the, uh, the time frame, how quickly we can deliver the, the reporting answer to the uh, final for chemist or whoever the user of that substance. Um, as compared to like an expert analysis setting. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to address any questions in the aftermath of this presentation. Okay.